All right, uh, we are in the book of Isaiah, and we left off in chapter 23. So if you would be turning to Isaiah 23, that's where we'll be tonight. Okay. Eventually the... Or not, this thing just went into standby without my knowledge. So there we go. We'll just have to wait for the slides to come up. But in the meantime, we are in Isaiah 23, so that won't stop us from, of course, talking about uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, the greater context, of course, is that we are in the oracles against the nations. Um, chapters 13 through 27 are really kind of this explanation of how God will humble the proud nations. Uh, and the main message of this, of course, is that the God of Israel is really also the God of all of the other nations as well. The God of this you know, obscure little sliver of Middle East and Palestine is really the God that created all nations that ever existed. And so he is the one that ultimately ultimately determines their collective fate and destiny and all that. Still working on it. Um, as far as the uh, oracles against the specific nations go, uh, chapters 21, 22, and 23 have been kind of following this general progression of Babylon and her allies, Jerusalem, the Valley of Vision. And now in chapter 23 we've turned to Tyre. And uh, what kind of a city was Tyre? Anybody know what kind of city Tyre was? Oh, it's up. Huh? It was the island city. It was the island city, yes. Uh, you can see the map up here on the screen. Uh, Tyre actually had two... Tyre city was comprised of two parts. Uh, and of course it was a seafaring city. It was a port city. You had the city that was on the mainland in, Le in what would be um, Lebanon, modern day. And then you had what was referred to as the island city. There was an island about a mile off the coast, uh, and that, well, not, not even a mile off the coast, that um, the people could flee to, and they had a fortress on the island that nobody was able to capture. Tyre was a very difficult city for military people to capture in the ancient world. And uh, as a great city, it kind of bookends with Babylon, both in 13 through 14 and in chapter 21. Um, now, Exactly. I have a list here of all the times Tyre has fallen under siege in the ancient world. Sennacherib tried to take the city in 705. He did not succeed, which is probably why it's not actually mentioned in any of his records, because Sennacherib only recorded the times he won. Easiest way to get an undefeated record, right? Um, the siege by Esarhaddon in 679 to 671 uh, was also unsuccessful. They submitted to Ashurbanipal in 663. There was a siege by Nebuchadnezzar in 585 through 573, which Ezekiel talks about. And that one's kind of important because Nebuchadnezzar took the mainland city, but he was unable to capture the island fortress. And they eventually worked out a truce and something like that. And, but Nebuchadnezzar did not fully capture the city of Tyre. The city was not captured until 332 whenever Alexander the Great took the remains and the ruins of the mainland city and built what essentially a land bridge to the island fortress. You know, he's put all this energy into building this bridge. Then they all crossed the bridge and captured the city. And uh, they tore it down and then they almost immediately rebuilt it. Um, Tyre still exists today. It's the fourth largest city in Lebanon. Um, you'll notice the the little dotted lines uh, describe what the land looks like today. There's no longer an island. It's been kind of joined together by natural land bridge. Um, so if you go to Tyre, they no longer have the capacity to form an island fortress. But all that to say, Tyre was known for being a seafaring city. And as such, it was a great economic power and influence in the ancient world. Which then kind of raises some interesting questions when Isaiah says this about it, beginning in verse 1. The oracle concerning Tyre, Tyre, Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is destroyed without house or harbor. It is reported to them from the land of Cyprus. Be silent, you inhabitants of the coastland, you merchants of Sidon. Your messengers crossed the sea and were on many waters. The grain of the Nile, the harvest of the river, was her revenue. She was the market of nations. Be ashamed, O Sidon, for the sea speaks, the stronghold of the sea, saying, I have neither travailed nor given birth. I have neither brought up young men nor reared virgins. When the report reaches Egypt, they will be in anguish at the report of Tyre. Pass over to Tarshish. Wail, O inhabitants of the coastland. Is this your jubilant city whose origin is from antiquity, whose feet used to carry her to colonize distant places? Oh. Now, Tyre didn't have a glorious empire, but she did have a lot of great wealth. You know, you might think of her as kind of a modern day, well, of an ancient version of New Orleans. Um, 
and you know, it talks about the ships of Tarshish, which would have been symbols of pride. We've already seen the ships of Tarshish mentioned back in chapter 2 in verse 16, actually, uh, in this kind of context, where God said that He would have a day of reckoning against all the high hills, against all the lofty oaks, against all the mountains, against every high tower, every fortified wall, and in verse 16, against all the ships of Tarshish and against all the beautiful craft. He's listing a bunch of things, and they all have the same thing in common, which is that they are all symbols of human pride. Uh, now, when Tyre is finally destroyed, there's no longer any port for these proud ships. He also mentions Sidon. Anybody know what Sidon was? Sidon was another city that was near Tyre that was actually usually allied with Tyre. Yeah. I can't remember exactly where it is on the map though, compared to Tyre. Sidon was basically Tyre's sister city. Um, and in fact, and frequently in the Bibles, Tyre and Sidon are paired together. They were so close. They were both in Phoenicia. Uh, they were usually allied. Um, and the coastlands... Uh, so, so you see Sidon is sometimes singled out in oracles against Tyre and vice versa. It, it's just they usually go together. Judgment on one equals judgment on the other. And whenever one of them got attacked, usually the other one got attacked too um, by all these sieges described here. The coastlands are told to be silent or to mourn, depending on how you translate that. Uh, there is no birth from the sea. Um, kind of got a shocking image in, uh, in verses in verse 4, where it says, I've neither travailed nor given birth. I've neither brought up young men nor reared virgins. And you get this idea of, you know, somebody's unable to have children. And, you know, that kind of language is later reversed in later on in the book, where Zion, you see Zion labors and gives birth. You think of Isaiah chapter 54 in verse 1, for instance, says... Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Um, Tyre's port had an influence both on uh, Tarshish and Egypt. They got some kind of uh, geographical extremities. The grain of the Nile and the harvest of the river. And anytime the Bible just calls it the river, it's talking about the Euphrates River, which you, know, you kind of got east and west extremities here. But Tyre no longer has those things. She is no longer able to buy and sell her wares. She is no longer the port of the merchants. Uh, Egypt mourns over Tyre with their commercial collapse. And in verse 7 asks, Is this your jubilant city? Could this really happen to Tyre? This great city, this place of trade? Surely, no, I mean, she had it made. She had all the money. She had all the prestige. She had all the power. She had all the wealth. Why would she fall? Well, what would the lesson from that be? Pride, exactly. And it's really the same thing that they were asking about the king of Babylon, wasn't it? Back in chapter 14, uh, in verses 16 and 17, you know, whenever the king of Babylon, in his mighty place, he finally falls down. In verses 16 and 17 of Isaiah 14, it says, that those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities? Who did not allow his prisoners to go home? Um... I guess I should have put the outline up here. Uh, you know, verses 1 through 7 describe the city's fall, which we've just read. But then, of course, verses 8 through 14 talk more about kind of the, the who done it. Beginning verse 8. It says, Who has planned this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns? Whose merchants were princes? Whose traders were the honored of the earth? The Lord of hosts has planned it to defile the pride of all beauty. To despise all the honored of the earth. Overflow your land like the Nile, O daughter of Tarshish. There is no more restraint. He has stretched his hand out over the sea. He has made the kingdom tremble. The Lord has given a command concerning Canaan to demolish its strongholds. He has said, You shall exult no more, O crushed virgin daughter of Sidon. Arise, pass over to Cyprus. Even there you will find no rest. Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This is the people which was not. Assyria appointed it for the desert creatures. They erected their siege towers. They stripped its palaces. They made it a ruin. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for your stronghold is destroyed. 
And you notice verse 14 looks a lot like verse 1. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is destroyed. Um, and, you know, verses 8 through 14 are kind of asking a whodunit question. Who is responsible for the fall of this great port city? Mark. You know, one thing that uh, to remember when you're studying this, it's almost impossible for a sea-based army to come in to land and make a landing and make it successful. Uh, the Normandy invasion was planned very carefully, and there was a huge push in Normandy to make the Germans think they were going to land at Calais. Because if all the Germans had been down at Normandy, they could have pushed the Allies right back off that beachhead into the sea, and the whole thing would have failed. Um, it's very, very rare in history that you see a, a sea to land battle with the, the, the armies coming from the sea being victorious <laughs> in the battle. The, the people on land usually push them back. So Tyre kind of had a reason to be kind of puffed up and think, hey, we can't be taken. Well, I mean, because yeah. anybody that takes us has got to come from the sea. Oh, yeah, I mean, they but got the when great. God says, oh, fortress. Well, it's all over. It doesn't matter how secure you are. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of this island fortress. And this isn't an accident of history. Isaiah says when this city gets destroyed, it's going to be God that's the one behind her destruction. Uh, now, somebody might point out, well, Tyre still exists today. Well, in a sense, yeah, but in a sense, no, not like that. They no longer have that kind of refuge that they can hold on to and protect themselves with. You know, they're no longer the great, you know, economic power that they were considered in the ancient world. That, I mean, you know, you don't hear people talking about, you know, Tyre being the place to go buy and sell and trade anymore, do you? I mean, it's a city in Lebanon. You know, how many, I mean, it's one of those things. Isaiah affirms this is not the accident of history. This is God that is behind its destruction. His plan is to defile her pride. True glory is found not in, in money, not in self-pride, not in financial success, but in God's methods. Uh, there's an, a couple of interesting points. Verse 11, the Lord has given a command concerning Canaan. Uh, one thing that's interesting, does anybody's Bible have something other than Canaan in verse 11? The Lord has given a command concerning... No. Well, one way, one way you could say that is merchants. Uh, the word for Canaanite and the word for merchant is actually the same. Um, you kind of see that. Zechariah makes a prophecy in Zechariah 14. There will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord in that day. Jesus, Jesus' act of driving the merchants out of the temple is kind of an interesting play on that whole idea. You know, he doesn't drive the Canaanites out of the temple because there aren't any Canaanites left, but he does kick the merchants out because they're essentially the same thing. Uh, then you might have something like that going on here. The Lord has given a, con a command concerning merchants to demolish its strongholds, um, which would make sense because Tyre is a city where the merchants sort of hung out. Uh, now, oh, another interesting point is when he talks in verse 12 about the virgin daughter of Sidon. Now, when you hear the phrase virgin daughter of something, what do you usually think comes next? Virgin daughter of Reading the Bible, what do you usually see? I've needed to word that question better, don't you? Don't I? Huh? Whatever the, no, does that sound similar to anything else we read in the prophets? <laughs> Any other titles we might read in the prophets that God gives to particular cities? Well, virgin daughter of Zion is what you see a lot. You'll see the expression virgin daughter of Zion in the Old Testament all the time. But here it's the virgin daughter of Sidon. It's kind of a purposeful play on that. And even more purposeful when you realize that there's only one letter difference between the two words in Hebrew. Um, but uh, the virgin... You also see the virgin daughter of Babylon mentioned in chapter 47, the virgin daughter of Egypt in, Isaiah, in Jeremiah 46, and of Judah in Lamentations 1. Uh, now this... This play of virgin daughter of Sidon, uh, there's this idea, I guess, that God is kind of trying to claim her for, as a people for himself. But you keep reading, and it turns out that Tyre is a harlot, a forgotten harlot city. Um, kind of debunks the idea that Jerusalem is the only city in the Old Testament referred to as a harlot. Some people try to put that forth, but Tyre is referred to that here. 
If you read verses 15 through 18, we have kind of an unusual uh, extension of this. But in that day, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years like the days of one king. At the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the harlot. Take your harp, walk about the city, O forgotten harlot. Pluck the strings skillfully, sing many songs that you may be remembered. It will come about at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre, and then she will go back to her harlot's wages. She will play the harlot with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Her gain and her harlot's wages will be set apart to the Lord. It will not be stored up or hoarded, but her gain will become sufficient food and choice attire for those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. Okay. Now when is that fulfilled? What is that talking about? Hey, Alexander the Great. <laughs> uh, now there is kind of a... Now, this passage is describing a time when Tyre is basically going to go back to her harlot ways. She's suffered, but then she's going to go back to it. Um, I mean, you think about it, you go back to that list of sieges. They've been attacked numerous times, and that's got to affect your economy somewhat, you know, whenever you fall under siege by opposing armies. But Tyre's winning defensive strategy was to have everybody flee to the island fortress, and it usually worked. Uh, so... Every time that they managed to, every time they managed to escape, they managed to go back to their harlots' wages after the siege was over. Happened in the days of Sennacherib, Nebuchadnezzar, Ashurbanipal, Nebuchadnezzar. But then Alexander the Great came and crushed the city, um, the island citadel. Now, is Isaiah specifically looking forward to that event? Well, it seems more that he's describing this in terms of a cycle. Fulfillment. It's a cyclical event that repeats itself over and over. The tire is repeatedly laid siege to and attacked in recovering, uh, capture, destruction, relapse. Um, exactly what all that means, you know, it's tricky. This is actually one of the harder oracles in Isaiah to get your head around. Um, but then we have the statement that Tyre is compared to a harlot. Why, why, why do you figure he'd compare her to a harlot? Would they ever turn to God? There's an interesting question to contemplate. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Tyre definitely provided the materials for the temple building. Um, you know, I mean, exactly how much they converted to the worship of the true God, I don't know if any of us could say. I mean, Jezebel was a Sidonian princess. She came from that region. She's, you know, she brings the worship of Baal into Israel. They were pretty big on Baal worship up there. Uh, exactly what to do with that, I don't know. Um, now, Tyre, it says she's forgotten for 70 years, which kind of sounds like what? 70 years. Um, does that sound like anything else we see in the Bible? <laughs> the remnant will return. Seventy years of captivity, that kind of thing. But I mean, it's interesting that he uses language that's used of Israel to talk about, you know, Tyre here. Huh? Yeah, the, 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 there does seem to be a connection with that in some respects. Seventy years is also described as the, the days of one king, or the lifetime of one king. Think of what Moses said in Psalm 90, where, you know, a man's days are seventy years, or, you know, if he's strong, eighty years. I always thought Moses was probably laughing to himself when he wrote that, because he lived to be 120, but uh, that's probably... <laughs> um, what, what we see here... You know, they contrast it with the days of a hired man. Tyre is going to be forgotten for 70 years, and then after that, she comes back into this place of prominence. God visits her, he restores her, and then she gets right back to her dirty tricks. Set. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm always, I always have a hard time to, with symbolic numbers in some of the prophets. I mean, I do think that you know there are definitely symbolic numbers. I wonder sometimes if we make too much of them, but that's another issue altogether. I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to me, he interprets it. Seventy years is basically representing the days of one king, basically a generation, if you will, is what he has in view here. 
somebody's lifetime is going to pass and then the cycle restarts or gets uh, renewed. It seems to be the idea. And it's the same thing with Israel being in captivity for 70 years. Uh, whenever uh, Judah or Jerusalem gets taken into captivity, you know, if you put a pin in the calendar on the day they got dragged off, which there's actually three different dates that they got deported, and then you put another pin in the calendar when they came back, which there's actually a couple different dates they got deported, is it going to add up to be exactly 70 years? No, probably not. You know, the point, I mean, it's a rounded number. It's not meant to get an exact, is it close to 70 years? Well, yeah. The Bible's not interested in giving you, you know, the precise date, time, down to the minute and second that this is happening. The point is to give you this, you know, this basic figure of 70 years to work with. You know, you've got a generation's going to go by, and then you'll go back, is the idea. Set. And Daniel 9, Daniel actually is reading Jeremiah Hey, we're getting pretty close to that appointed number of years. Yeah. And that's when he prays uh, the prayer of Daniel. I think it's super cool. Daniel. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is, that is kind of interesting to note that. Um, Daniel 9, verse 2. Now, one other thing. An interesting twist. In verse 18, chapter 20, Isaiah 23 and verse 18, her gain and her harlot's wages will be set apart to the Lord. It will not be stored up or hoarded, but her gain will become sufficient food and choice attire for those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. What's going to happen to Tyre's wages? They're going to be what? Stored up for the Lord. Anybody think that's odd? Why is that odd? And if you're in the Deuteronomy class, you should know. <laughs> yes, they did not. They, you were not supposed to bring a harlot's wages into the house of the Lord. Anybody want to guess what verse in Deuteronomy says that? Huh? Well, no, Deuteronomy 23, verse 18. Same verse that it comes up in in Isaiah. That's one of those weird coincidences of Scripture. Deuteronomy 23, verse 18, and Isaiah 23, verse 18 are basically the opposite of each other. Um, I think that verse... I mean, I, don't, I think verse, verse references, you know, they were, they, came, they were come up with by men, but that's one of those weird coincidences. It just kind of makes you stop and go, well, at least that's an interesting memory device. <laughs> oh, the Daniel 2, Joel 2, Acts 2, Isaiah 2... Micah 4 ruins it though. So, uh. <laughs> But yeah, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, uh, actually verses 17 and 18, none of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute, nor shall any of the sons of Israel be a cult prostitute. You shall not bring the hire of a harlot or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God for any votive offering, for both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. In other words, you're not supposed to go out and make money being a prostitute and then come in and stick that in the collection plate. That's bad. God doesn't want that. It's dirty money. But here, Tyre sets apart her harlot's wages to the Lord. Now that's kind of weird. How do we deal with that? What do we do with that? It seems like she can work as hard as she wants, but she doesn't get to keep what she makes. And there might be something to that. Anybody else got another idea? I just... I, I, this is one that I'm not settled on, on quite yet. So. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Yeah. Don. Oh. Right, yeah. Uh, there's definitely something to that as well. Does this remind us of, you know, I mean, you know, the wealth of Tyre becomes food and clothing for those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. Uh, there's kind of a theme that runs throughout Isaiah of the wealth of the nations being given to God's people. Uh, we see this a little bit, in, especially in Isaiah chapter 60. And Isaiah chapter 60 is, in many ways, kind of a foil to Isaiah 23. Uh, start in verse 4. 
Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They will come to you. Your sons will come from afar. Your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like the doves to their latices? Surely the coastlands will wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because He has glorified you. Foreigners will build up your walls, and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, and in my favor I have had compassion on you. Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed day or night, so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. Uh, and he goes on and on. And there's other things in there that kind of look like they go with the Tyre Oracle and Isaiah 23. But you have this kind of this image of all the nations are going to take their money and bring it as a tribute offering to the people who live in Jerusalem. Well, that would have been unthinkable to people that lived in Isaiah's day. Jerusalem was a pawn in a bigger struggle between Egypt and Assyria. You know, Jerusalem was insignificant in the grand scheme of things. All these nations are going to come and bring their wealth to her? Well, and that gets right back to the promise from Isaiah 2 that the Lord's mountain will be established as the chief of the mountains. And the point isn't that God's people are going to, you know, that God's people in the ethnic, physical sense of Jerusalem are going to receive this great wealth. The point is that ultimately, the spiritual Israel, the true people of God, are the ones who will be receiving this kind of tribute. In fact, you see this kind of thing at the end of the book of Revelation. One of the descriptions of the holy city in Revelation 21. Uh, it says that in verses 25 through 27, in the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is part of God's plan, to gather the nations and to flood them with the wealth in Zion, His holy city. Any comments or questions up to the end of Isaiah 23? The Davidic kingdom spread really far. Is Tyre ever under Christian? David? You know, I can't remember. I mean, they, they, they had, they, I mean, they definitely had nations giving them tribute at some point. In Isaiah's time, no, that wasn't the case. Um, I mean, Ahaz, well, after Uzziah, everything kind of collapsed. Uzziah was the big, you know, the big bully on the block for a while. Between him and Jeroboam II, they managed to ex get a lot of tribute from the nations around them. But in Isaiah 6, near the beginning of the book, Uzziah dies. And with Uzziah dying, you know, drops off a lot of their uh, prestige and power that came with his rule. Then you got guys like Jotham and Ahaz who were not very strong rulers at all. And then you got Hezekiah who, even though Hezekiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord, you know, he doesn't really gain the kind of you know, economic prestige that his father did. His, the main prophet of his reign was ultimately spiritual rather than physical. And the Assyrians were dominating everybody at every turn at that point. But God envisions a time, Isaiah envisions a time, whenever past this point, that all of the nations will bring their wealth to Israel and they will have that kind of tribute in a way that they never had it before, really. The wealth of nations, even from places like Egypt and Assyria, will ultimately bring their wealth to Jerusalem and worship there. That, that, that's ultimately realized in Jesus and the acceptance of the Gentiles into the people of God. Any other thoughts? Anything else you want to add? Which seems rather opposite to what is told in Hezekiah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. You know, Hezekiah shows off the wealth of the temple and Isaiah tells him, you know, well, now you've done it. They're going to carry all the wealth off to Babylon. Uh, that's not what... I mean, Hezekiah made the mistake in Isaiah 39 of showing it to Merodach Baladan, to the 
Babylonians. And the idea behind that is probably, you know, they were trying to make an alliance with the Babylonians, which was precisely what God said, don't do. Don't make alliances with these foreign nations. They can't help you. They can't save you. But I can. Uh, we'll get more into that later. Um, as we move into chapter 24, this is really kind of a new section of the book. Uh, in Isaiah 24 through 27, we have kind of, I'm calling it the oracle against the world because I guess that fits up there. What we have basically is a tale of two cities, a world's city and the city of God. And there's no specific nation that's addressed throughout, although uh, um, we're, we're going we're to talk about how these, these ideas might be applicable to various nations. Um, and actually, I just answered the first question on the handout. What nation is being addressed in chapter 24 through 27? Well, none. It's not against any specific nation. It's against the whole world. Uh, some people call this section the Isaiah Apocalypse. Uh, of course, there's this never-ending argument about what is and is not considered apocalyptic, and I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but this section concludes these oracles against the nations, which were intended to demonstrate God's supremacy over all the earth. Let's read chapter 24. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. And the people will be like the priest, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, the creditor like the debtor. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled. For the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers. The world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. The new wine mourns, the vine decays, all the merry-hearted sigh. The gaiety of tambourine ceases, the noise of revelers stops, the gaiety of the harp ceases. They do not drink wine with song, strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of chaos is broken down, every house is shut up so that none may enter. There is an outcry in the streets concerning the wine, all joy turns to gloom. The gaiety of the earth is banished, desolation is left in the city, and the gate is battered to ruins. For thus it will be in the midst of the earth among the peoples, as the shaking of an olive tree, as the gleanings when the grape harvest is over. They raise their voices, they shout for joy. They cry out from the west concerning the majesty of the Lord. Therefore glorify the Lord in the east, the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the coastlands of the sea, from the ends of the earth, we hear songs, glory to the righteous one. But I say, woe to me. Woe to me! Alas for me! The treacherous deal treacherously, and the treacherous deal very treacherously. Terror and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the report of disaster will fall into the pit. He who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. For the windows above are opened, and the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken asunder. The earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack. For its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall, never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high, and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon. They will be confined in prison. And after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. And His glory will be before His elders. That's kind of scary. Into the world, it sounds like. And, you know, there's a definite application there. Um, one thing that we see in all of this is kind of the beginning of a tale of two cities. Uh, throughout chapters 24 through 27, you know, you have something that's called the city of chaos. Uh, the word for chaos appears in Genesis 1, you know, when the earth is formless and void. It's kind of this just primeval ocean, this chaotic thing that hasn't yet been created, a discreated world, if you will. It's just the fortified city, the unassailable city, the ruined city. And really, this world city encapsulates the spirit of Babylon that we've been talking about all along. But by contrast, from 
uh, at the very end of the chapter, you'll notice that in verse 23, it says that God, God talks about Mount Zion and Jerusalem. This mountain, a strong city, etc. You know, you have that talked about throughout as well, which recalls the mountain of the Lord of hosts that God promised He would set up in chapter 2. And of course, the story of the Bible is really the story of two cities. From the very beginning, when Cain built a city and, you know, as a monument to his own evil, when Babylon built, they built the Tower of Babylon and the city in an effort to make a name for themselves. Mankind has been building cities as monuments to his own pride since the beginning. And if this conflict reaches its climax in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, this description of this city Babylon, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth, and how God will eventually destroy her and put an end to her in that idea. And of course, this, you know, this idea is reliant in some respects on what we see in Isaiah 24 through 27. Uh, now all of that to say, the in verse 1, you know, the, earth, the Lord lays the earth waste. He devastates it. He distorts its surface. He scatters its inhabitants. You know, it's not just one nation anymore. It's the whole earth. In verse 2, what does verse 2 teach us about the nature of judgment? No distinctions? Okay. Yeah. That's the idea. The people will be like the priest. Uh, the, in other words, the laymen are going to be like the clergy, basically. Uh, the servant like the master, the maid like the mistress, etc., etc. Judgment is the great equalizer. Uh, in fact, Hosea uses a similar expression in Hosea 4 and verse 9 where he says, like people, like priest. Judgment, you know, judgment is not discriminate about who gets killed and who doesn't. Uh, the people aren't going to be in a hurry to pull rank when everything that gives them rank has been destroyed. That will be taken away from them. You notice almost every verse in the first six verses, here's the outline of chapter 24, by the way, almost every verse in the first six verses emphasizes the totality. The surface of the earth is devastated. It's distorted. Every level of society is affected. It's completely laid waste. It's completely despoiled. The world mourns. It fades. It withers. It's devoured by curse. The inhabitants are burned. Is anybody left out of this? There's an emphasis on the totality here. That God's destruction of the earth will be sudden and final and irreversible. Verse 5 mentions an everlasting covenant. They, they transgressed laws, violated statutes, and broke the everlasting covenant. What's that talking about? God make an everlasting covenant with the whole earth? Romans 1, even though they knew the ordinance of God. It's, Romans 1 isn't about they should have known the ordinance of God. It's that they knew it and they did it. They broke it anyway. Yeah. Is there any place in the Bible where God makes a covenant that would apply to everybody on the whole earth? Well, hmm? No. Ah, well, well, there's one. Yeah, right? Yeah, well, there's Noah. That goes all the way. That's an everlasting covenant, isn't it? You know? God. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, that's, I mean, there's a sense in which, you know, you break that, this judgment's applicable to you as well. Uh, that covenant hadn't been made by the time Isaiah writes, but Isaiah does talk quite a... Isaiah definitely talks about that covenant uh, in his prophecies. So there might be something to that. Um, there is, I do like the Noah thing, because there are scattered allusions to the Noah story throughout this chapter. Uh, and it, it kind of explains the reference to polluting. Well, what was I mean, we talk about the covenant of the rainbow. God promised never to destroy the earth by flood again. Were there any conditions to the Noah covenant? Was there anything that God said they had to do or not do? Anybody remember? Hmm? Well, there were no conditions regarding God destroying the earth, God not destroying the earth by water. That wasn't going to that isn't going to happen ever. The next destruction of the earth is going to be by fire, and where everything is burned up. So that part of that covenant is, is unconditional. But the destruction of the earth is conditional upon men living godly lives. 
Was there anything? Well, maybe we should go back to the text of the. Maybe we should go. Huh? Don't kill each other. Don't kill each other. Yes. Thank you, Seth. Genesis 9, whenever God makes the covenant with Noah, one of the things he says, you know, in verse 5, surely. Well, he mentions not eating blood, among other things, too. Um, you know, he says, The fear of you, the terror of you, will be on beast of the earth, every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground, all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they're given. First time in the Bible that God allows them to eat meat. Prior to this point, mankind were vegetarians. It's another issue we'll get into. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood must be shed. For in the image of God he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. I find it interesting that God introduces capital punishment before He introduces the Ten Commandments, which everybody always likes to quote and say, you know, do not murder. Well, God explains what He means by that before He even gives that law. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood must be shed. Uh, so that what we have here is this pollution. There's this reference to pollution uh, here in verse Isaiah 24 and verse 5. The earth is polluted by its inhabitants. Why? It's been polluted by all the innocent blood they've shed, ultimately. Uh, now, admittedly, is Isaiah specifically thinking about the Noah covenant? Well, you know, that's anybody's guess. I mean, the phrase everlasting covenant is used of the covenant with Abraham in Psalm 105. It's used of Moses in Leviticus 24. It's used of the covenant with David in 2 Samuel 23. And it, as Don already pointed out, it is used of the future covenant that God will make through the Messiah in Isaiah 55 and verse 3 and in 61 and verse 8. I mean, you know, I would say that you know the covenant with Abraham does ultimately affect the other nations. Um, I, I, also, I would say even that you know the law of Moses. One of the great misconceptions out there is that the law of Moses didn't have applicability for outsiders. It did actually, and that's uh, to go into all the references to explain why it would take longer than we have left in class, unfortunately. But that is a good question to bring up. We, I might get into that next time, or we might push on through Isaiah 24. We'll see. But uh, it's a good question to think about. Um, any other comments or questions before we close? We're pretty much at the end. Uh, we will pick up in Isaiah 24 next time, and we'll hopefully get into more of this.